In this video, we'll be discussing improper integrals. An improper integral is an integral that falls into one of these two categories. It either has infinite limits or an infinite discontinuity in the interval. For the infinite limit or infinite limits category, that could look something like this, the integral from 1 to infinity of e to the x dx, the integral from negative infinity to 1 of e to the x dx. That's what's shown in this situation here. Our lower bound is negative infinity and our upper bound is x equals 1. Or maybe we would have a situation where both of the limits are infinite, like the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the x dx. This is not really something that we are used to seeing, but we're going to figure out how we can evaluate these later in the video. Now the other option for how you could have an improper integral is that you could have an infinite discontinuity in the interval. For example, if we were taking the integral from negative 1 to 1 of 1 over x squared dx, which would be represented by this graph over here, both of these solid lines are going up to infinity here because we have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0, since when our x equals 0, our denominator is 0. Now this may be a problem because it's possible that we don't have a finite amount of area up in this shaded area. Now another situation where we have an infinite discontinuity in the interval would be the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 over x dx, shown in this graph right here. The problem here is that we have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0, so at our lower bound, that's where our problem is. We can't integrate from 0 to 1 if our graph is approaching infinity when we get to x equals 0. So these are two examples of having an infinite discontinuity in the interval. Now, this means that whenever you see an integral like this, you're always going to need to check whether there is an infinite discontinuity in the integrand, and if so, whether it's in the interval over here. If we have something like the integral from 2 to 3 of 1 over x dx, that wouldn't be a problem at all, because that would be a finite amount of space. We have the integral from 2 to 3, and we can see clearly on our graph that, that would not be a problem. That is not an improper integral. But if we have something like from 0 to 1, or maybe from negative 1 to 1, that is going to be a problem. So how do we evaluate these types of integrals algebraically? Let's take a look at this example, the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x cubed dx. Now this is an example of a problem with an infinite limit, because we have a limit of infinity. That's our upper limit. The way that we're going to do this, and the way that we're pretty much always going to solve improper integrals, is replacing the problem with a variable and using a limit. What that looks like in this case, if we are trying to identify what the problem is, the problem is this infinity up here. If we had an actual number up here, that would be fine. We would be able to integrate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace that infinity with a t. I'm just using a variable to stand in for the infinity. So I'm integrating from 1 to t of 1 over x cubed dx. But then what happened to the infinity? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to place a limit on the front. We'll take the limit as t approaches infinity. If we did direct substitution here and we substituted in the infinity, we would put it right up here and we would be left with the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x cubed dx, which was our original thing. Now, using this method is going to allow us to actually integrate, and you'll see why when we work out this problem in just a second. What we're really trying to find is what does the area under this curve from 1 to infinity approach? That's why we have the limit on the front, because the limit tells us what is happening as a variable approaches a certain number, in this case, infinity. Let's work through our first example. We have the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x cubed dx. The first step is to identify the problem and replace that with a variable and add a limit to the front. The problem here is the infinity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say this is equal to the limit as t approaches infinity of the integral from 1 to t of 1 over x cubed dx. Rewriting it like this is now going to allow me to take this integral and then see what happens when I plug in infinity for t. So now I'm going to keep my limit on the front. I'm still having the limit as t approaches infinity, but I'm going to rewrite this 1 over x cubed as x to the power of negative 3 so that I can actually integrate. Now I can use the power rule. Still keeping the limit on the front, this is equal to the limit as t approaches infinity, and then what is the integral of x to the power of negative 3? Well, that would be x to the power of negative 2 over negative 2, and then the bounds that I have are 1 and t, so I'll stick those over here. Now that I have actually found the antiderivative, I don't need the integral symbol anymore, but I do still need the limit on here. So this is still equal to the limit as t approaches infinity, and then this, the x to the power of negative 2 over negative 2, I'm going to rewrite that as negative 1 over 2x squared, and my bounds are 1 and t. Now we're going to use the fundamental theorem, plug in t, and subtract plugging in 1. 
still keeping that limit on the front because we have not yet plugged in infinity for t. So this would be equal to, inside the brackets, we would have negative 1 over 2t squared minus negative 1 over 2 times 1 squared. Clean that up a little bit and you get limit as t approaches infinity of negative 1 over 2t squared plus 1 half. At this point, we are going to plug in infinity for t. We'll see what happens. If you plug infinity in for t, we would have negative 1 over 2 times infinity squared, which means that our denominator here is going to be a really, really, really large number. If we take 1 divided by a really, really large number, that's going to get closer and closer to 0. So this part is going to get closer and closer to 0. And then we are left with 1 half. That means that this is equal to 1 half. Therefore, the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x cubed dx is equal to 1 half. Now that's kind of weird to think about. That means that if we take the area under the curve from 1 all the way up until infinity, our area is going to approach 1 half. The area does not approach infinity just because our upper bound is infinity. The area is going to be a finite number. It's going to be 1 half. That means that this is an example of a convergent integral because we get a finite numerical answer, not positive or negative infinity or does not exist. Convergent integrals have answers like 1 half, 5, negative 4, any set finite number. Let's try another example. The integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over rad x dx. First thing I'm going to do is identify my problem, replace that with a variable, and stick a limit on the front. Again, I see that my problem here is infinity. I can't integrate up until infinity because infinity is not an actual number that I can really plug in. So I'm going to rewrite this as the limit as t, I'll use t for my variable, approaches infinity, my problem, from 1 to t, and then I'm going to rewrite the 1 over rad x as x to the power of negative 1 half dx to make it a little bit easier to integrate. Now, since I have 1 to t instead of 1 to infinity, which I could not do, now I can actually start integrating. First, I'll find the antiderivative of x to the power of negative 1 half, and I still need to keep my limit on the front here. That stays on until the very end. Limit as t approaches infinity, and then what would go inside these brackets? Well, we have x to the power of negative 1 half, and we need to add 1 to that negative 1 half, so that's really x to the power of 1 half over 1 half, and we are evaluating that at 1 and t. Then I'm just going to rewrite that, limit as t approaches infinity, and then dividing by 1 half is the same thing as multiplying by 2, so we really have 2 rad x in here. So we have 2 rad x evaluated at 1 and t. Now we can plug in the t and then subtract plugging in the 1 using the fundamental theorem. We are still keeping the limit on the front because we have not yet plugged in infinity for t. So we would have 2 rad t minus 2 rad 1. 2 rad 1 is really 2. So now we can think about what happens if we plug in an infinity for t. Well, if we plug in infinity into this square root right here, the square root of infinity is still infinity. So if we have 2 times the square root of infinity, that's going to be an infinitely large number minus 2. If we take an infinitely large number minus 2, that's still just going to be an infinitely large number. So this would be equal to infinity. Now, something can't really be equal to infinity. So in this case, our answer would actually not exist. This would be does not exist. Now, the area under the curve of 1 over rad x dx, as we approach infinity, going from 1, is going to approach infinity. Our area is not bounded in this case. This is an example of a divergent integral because we get positive or negative infinity or does not exist. In this case, we got positive infinity, but if you got negative infinity for your answer, that would also mean that you got a divergent integral. Notice that when we have an integral in the format integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p dx, the integral is going to converge if p is greater than 1. So in this case, we had integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x cubed, so p would be 3, p is greater than 1, and our integral converged. And it's going to diverge if p is less than or equal to 1. For example, in this situation. We have the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the power of 1 half, and 1 half is definitely less than or equal to 1, so we saw that our integral diverged here. This is an important concept, and it can be pretty helpful if you're given an integral in this format. Now, this number down here doesn't necessarily have to be 1. If we had something like the integral from 3 to infinity over, of 1 over x squared dx, we could still use that same rule here. In this case, the integral would converge because p, the exponent, which is 2 in this case, is greater than 1. Now, we don't just want to say that an integral converges. We want to say that it converges to a specific value because convergent, by definition, means that we have a finite numerical answer. So for this example up here, instead of just saying 1 half, I would say this integral converges to 1 half. 
And for this integral down here, instead of saying it's equal to does not exist or equal to infinity, that one is really just going to be divergent. So I'm going to erase the box around this and I'm going to write divergent as my answer. Now we'll talk about what to do if our lower bound is infinite and our upper bound is infinite. Assuming that f of x is continuous on the interval from negative infinity to infinity, we can split the improper integral, integral from negative infinity to infinity of f of x dx, into integral from negative infinity to c, where c is any constant, of f of x dx plus the integral from c to infinity of f of x dx, where c is some number between negative infinity and infinity, so really anything. Typically we use 0 or 1 because that's pretty easy to work with. Now you should know from integral properties, which I do have a separate video about, that when we add these two together, we really get this. So we're splitting it apart in order to facilitate this process of improper integration. Then what we would do is evaluate each new integral, meaning this one and this one, separately. If either of the new integrals diverges, then the whole thing diverges. So if you get one part that diverges, you can stop and say this integral is divergent. But if you get two values, like maybe this one was one half and this one was two thirds, you would have to add one half and two thirds together in order to get your answer. Let's try with this example. We have the integral from negative infinity to infinity of 3x squared dx. I'm going to split this one into the integral from negative infinity to zero. I'm just going to use zero as my c because that's a pretty easy number to work with of 3x squared dx plus the integral from zero to infinity of 3x squared dx. Now we have two separate improper integrals that we need to evaluate. First I will use this one. Again we need to identify the problem and then stick a limit on it. So our problem in this case is going to be negative infinity. So we'll say limit as t approaches negative infinity and in this case our t is going to be on the bottom because that was our problem. Integral from t to 0 of 3x squared dx then when we evaluate that, we're keeping the limit notation on the front. Then we find the antiderivative of 3x squared. So the antiderivative of 3x squared is going to be 3x cubed over 3. And then we are going to evaluate that at t and 0. Then, still keeping the limit notation on the front, as t approaches negative infinity, we're going to plug in 0 and subtract plugging in t. Now the antiderivative is really just x cubed, because those 3's are going to cancel. The final step is to plug in negative infinity for t right here. So if we have negative infinity cubed, that would still be negative infinity and then minus negative infinity. So this entire thing is really just going to be positive infinity. So if this is equal to positive infinity, that means that this particular integral is going to diverge. And if this part of the integral diverges, that means that the whole thing diverges. Because if either new integral diverges, then that means that the entire thing diverges. Therefore, the integral from negative infinity to infinity of 3x squared dx diverges. Now, if we did not get plus or minus infinity for this, then we would have to evaluate the second portion. So then we would replace um, this with the limit here. We would say plus the limit as t approaches positive infinity, dealing with this integral of the integral from 0 to t of 3x squared dx. However, since this one diverged, we don't need to go and do that extra step. We may also need to use this method of splitting the integral apart in a situation like this. The integral from negative 5 to 1 of 1 over x squared dx. Now, at first glance, this might look fine. You would say, well, we don't, have an, we don't have an infinity or a negative infinity for our limits, and it looks okay, so I could just evaluate it. In this case, though, we have to, be, we have to pay really close attention to what our integrand is. Our integrand is 1 over x squared dx, and 1 over x squared dx has a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. The graph of 1 over x squared looks something like this. So if we have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0, we're going to split the integral apart at our problem, which is x equals 0. I'm going to rewrite this as the integral from negative 5 to 0 of 1 over x squared dx. And maybe instead of doing 1 over x squared dx, I'll do x to the power of negative 2 so that it makes it a little bit easier to integrate later. x to the power of negative 2 dx plus the integral from 0, which is our lower bound, to 1 of x to the power of negative 2 dx. So now I have two separate integrals and 0 is my problem. So I split it apart where my problem was. Now I can use the method of putting a limit on the front and replacing my problem with a variable. Remember, if either of these integrals diverges, the whole thing is going to diverge. I'm going to say the limit as t approaches 0 of the integral from negative 5 to t of x to the power of negative 2 dx.
Now in this case, we don't just want zero in general, we want zero from the specific side. Is it the left-hand side or the right-hand side? In this case, we're going to be coming at zero from the left-hand side because our interval was from negative five to zero. So we would be coming from the negative side or from the left-hand side. So I'm just gonna use my notation there and say zero from the left-hand side. Now I can find the antiderivative of x to the power of negative two. Still keeping the limit on the front, the antiderivative here would be x to the power of negative 1 over negative 1, and we're evaluating that at negative 5 and t. Now we can clean this up into negative 1 over x. Then we plug in t and subtract plugging in negative 5. And I have been forgetting to put the little left-hand side thing on there, so I'm going to put the little negative sign up there, 0 from the left-hand side, 0 from the left-hand side, and then we would have negative 1 over t minus negative 1 over negative 5. Now we've got a lot of negatives here, so I'm going to clean this one up. And this integral is going to come out to be the limit as t approaches 0 from the left-hand side of negative 1 over t minus 1 fifth. Now, if we plug in 0 for this denominator, that is not going to work. We can't have 0 as our denominator. Therefore, this portion of the limit does not exist. So if this one does not exist, that means that this portion is divergent. So therefore, the entire thing would be divergent. Now, assuming that we got an actual number for this portion of the integral, we would have to do the second one and make sure that that one didn't diverge too. If we got two actual numbers, we would then just add them together. But you do need to keep in mind that the rule is that if either of the new integrals diverges, then that means that the whole thing diverges. We may also need to use more complex integration techniques. And most commonly that would mean u substitution, but it could also be partial fractions or integration by parts to evaluate these types of improper integrals. In this first one, we have the integral from one to infinity of x cubed over one plus two x to the fourth squared dx. Hopefully you see what the problem is here right away. We have up here at infinity, that's a problem. We can't be integrating up until infinity. Now we should also check our denominator to see if we have any vertical asymptotes in this interval. If we set 1 plus 2x to the 4th equal to 0, that would mean that x to the 4th would need to equal negative 1 half. And that's never going to happen because we can never put something to the 4th and have it be equal to a negative number. So the only problem here that we need to worry about is going to be the, the infinity right up here. That means that we're going to rewrite it with t approaching infinity. So we'll say this is equal to the limit as t approaches infinity of the integral from 1 to t of x cubed over 1 plus 2x to the fourth squared dx. Now at this point we have to figure out how do we integrate this x cubed over 1 plus 2x to the fourth squared? Well that really looks like a u sub problem. We could set u equal to 1 plus 2x to the fourth and then evaluate. Now I'm going to do this off to the side because normally when we do u substitution we want to change the bounds but changing the bounds gets a little bit weird when you're doing it in conjunction with this. You could do it, but I think it's just a little bit easier to do it, to work out the integral off to the side and then plug it back in with the original variable. So I'll show you what I mean by that. So if we just had the integral of x cubed over 1 plus 2x to the fourth squared dx without bounds, we would say u equals 1 plus 2x to the fourth. And that means that du dx would be equal to 8x cubed. Now we're wanting to swap something out for the x cubed dx. So we'll isolate x cubed on this side and we'll get the dx over there. So we'd have 1 8 du is equal to x cubed dx. That means that we can rewrite this one as the integral of 1 over u squared, because the u is 1 plus 2x to the fourth. The x cubed dx, that's really 1 8 du. I'm going to put the 1 8 out here and then the du at the end. Then we can integrate and we want to rewrite this 1 over u squared as u to the power of negative 2. And that's really negative 1 over 8u. Now we don't want to plug a u back into this problem because we're doing it dx up here with our definite integral. So let's plug our 1 plus 2x to the fourth back in for u. We'll say this is really equal to negative 1 over 8 times and then u is 1 plus 2x to the fourth. Great, that made our problem a lot easier. So now when I'm up in this problem again, I'm going to rewrite this as the limit as t approaches infinity, and then I know that my antiderivative of this integrand is going to be negative 1 over, and then I guess I will just write it as 8 plus, and then I'll distribute the 8, so it'll be 16x to the fourth. And we are evaluating this at 1 and t. Now I'll plug in t and then subtract plugging in 1, still keeping my limit on the front.
So now I have the limit as t approaches infinity of negative 1 over 8 plus 16t squared plus 1 over 8 plus 16. This was supposed to be minus negative 1, but I just changed that to a positive 1 right there when I plugged in the 1. Now we can see that when we plug in infinity for t, if we plug this infinity in right here, we would have negative 1 over 8 plus 16 times infinity squared. So our denominator is approaching a really, really large number, which means that this entire first term is going to approach 0. So this is equal to zero. So what we're really dealing with is the limit as t approaches infinity of one over eight plus 16. And we don't really need that limit notation on there anymore because we can just say that our answer is equal to one over eight plus 16 or one twenty-fourth. So that's equal to one twenty-fourth. We could also say that this integral converges to one twenty-fourth. Let's take a look at the integral from four to infinity of two x times e to the power of negative x squared dx. First, we see the problem. It's up here at infinity. So I'm going to rewrite this as the limit as t approaches infinity of the integral from 4 to t of 2x times e to the power of negative x squared dx. Now I think I'm going to have to use u substitution on this problem because it looks like we have a function negative x squared plugged inside the e to the x function. So I'll say let u equal negative x squared. That means that du dx would be equal to negative 2x and we have a 2x dx in our original problem. So we can move the negative to the other side and we would have a negative du, move the dx to the other side and we have 2x dx. So this 2x dx will be replaced with a negative du. Now I don't wanna do this in the integral that I'm working through now, so I'm actually gonna write this out as a separate indefinite integral. Integral of 2x e times e to the power of negative x squared dx is equal to, and then we can start plugging in our u's, so the 2x dx, we know that that's going to be a negative du. So we'll stick the negative on the outside, integral of e to the negative x squared, but negative x squared is u, so e to the u du. e to the u is its own derivative, so we really have a negative e to the u, or a negative e to the power of negative x squared. Now when we go back up to this original problem, we're still keeping the limit on the front, but now we can integrate this. It's negative e to the power of negative x squared. And we're evaluating that at 4 and t. Now if we plug in t, let's see what we get. We'll plug in t, then subtract plugging in 4. So we'll have negative e to the power of negative t squared minus negative e to the power of negative 4 squared. Now I don't really like how this is written, so I'm going to clean this up a little bit. Negative e to the power of negative t squared, that's really just going to be negative 1 over e to the power of t squared. We can move that e to the negative t squared, get that entire term down to the denominator. And then we would say plus e to the power of negative 16, or 1 over e to the 16. Now we can plug in infinity. If we plug in infinity for the t squared down here, e to the power of infinity is also going to be infinity. So we have 1 over infinity here, or negative 1 over infinity. Now 1 over a really, really large number is getting closer and closer to 0. So this portion is equal to 0. That means that we are left with 1 over e to the 16th. So that would be our answer. This integral converges to 1 over e to the 16th. Let r be the unbounded region between the graph of y equals the natural log of x plus 5 to the fifth over x and the x-axis for x being greater than or equal to 20. What is the area of region r? This one is a bit tricky to think about, but what they're really trying to get at is they want the integral from 20 all the way up until infinity because it says the unbounded region and x has to be greater than or equal to 20. So we'll take the integral from 20 to infinity of this curve right here because what integration really does is just finds the area between this curve and the x-axis. So we have the natural log of x plus 5 to the fifth over x dx and this is the integral that we are trying to evaluate. Now let's see if we can figure out a way to do this. First, we see that this is an improper integral because we have that bound of infinity. And when we have a bound of infinity, we always wanna replace that with a limit. So we'll say limit as t approaches infinity of the integral from 20 to t of that same integrand. And then how are we going to solve this? I'm going to try u sub here because the natural log of x plus five has been stuck inside the function x to the fifth. I'm gonna do this with an indefinite integral if I did this with an indefinite integral, I would have u equals the natural log of x plus 5. And then du dx, well, what's the derivative of the natural log of x plus 5? Derivative of the natural log is just 1 over x. Derivative of 5 is 0. So that means that du 
is really equal to one over x dx. Now I see an over x dx here, so this portion is really the one over x dx. So that portion is really the du. That means that this is equal to the integral of u to the fifth du. Because this was my u, I had it to the fifth power, this was the du. Now the integral of u to the fifth du would be u to the sixth over six. And then if we plug back in our original function, we'll have the natural log of x plus five to the sixth over six. Now let's apply this back to our original problem. We still have our limit on the front. This time we're going to replace this entire integrand with this. And we're evaluating that at 20 and t. So now we'll plug in t and subtract plugging in 20. Now when we plug in infinity for t, in this term we would have the natural log of infinity, which is infinity, plus 5 to the 6, so that numerator is going to be making infinity over 6, so this first term is going to infinity, minus a whole bunch of numbers here. This would be a finite number. That's not infinity. So in this case, our answer would actually be equal to infinity. But can something ever really be equal to infinity? No. So we could write down infinity, infinity down here, but that means that the area of region R is actually going to be infinite because this integral is divergent. For what value or values of w will the integral from 4 to infinity of 1 over x to the power of 4w minus 12 dx diverge? In this case, we're going to have to use that rule that we mentioned earlier. If we have the integral in the format 1 to infinity, or any number to infinity, I'm just going to use the number 1 here, of 1 over x to the p dx, and p is greater than 1, that means that our integral converges. But if p is less than or equal to 1, that means that the integral diverges. So let's take a look at what that p value would be in this case. We have x to the power of p, or x to the power of 4w minus 12. Let's figure out what values it's going to diverge for. So it needs to be less than or equal to 1. So 4w minus 12 needs to be less than or equal to 1. Get rid of the 12, and we have 4w is less than or equal to 13. So w needs to be less than or equal to 13 fourths to make this integral diverge. So 0 is less than or equal to 13 fourths. So that value would make the integral diverge. 2 is less than or equal to 13 fourths, so that one would make the integral diverge, but 9 is not less than or equal to 13 fourths. Therefore, choice B would be our correct answer because the values for 1 and 2 will make that integral diverge. Consider the function f of x equals 1 over x squared minus 2x plus 1. Find the value of the integral from 0 to 2 of f of x dx or show that it diverges. So if we're trying to find the value of this integral, the first thing I'm going to copy down is I'm going to rewrite this function, this, this actual function, in place of f of x. Now I'm also noticing that this denominator is factorable. This could be rewritten as 1 over x minus 1 squared. So we have the integral from 0 to 2 of 1 over x minus 1 squared dx. Now this is going to be a problem because we see that within this interval from 0 to 2, we're going to have a vertical asymptote. When x equals 1, this function has a vertical asymptote. Therefore, we're going to have to break this into two separate integrals. Since our problem is at x equals 1, we're going to break it into the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 over x minus 1 squared dx, plus the integral from 1 to 2 of 1 over x minus 1 squared dx. Now let's set these up as, as limits, because we know that 1 is going to be our problem. So this entire thing is really equal to, first I'll do the first one, the limit as t approaches 1 from the left side, because we were going from 0 to 1, approaching from the left side, of the integral from 0 to t of 1 over x minus 1 squared dx. And then we are adding this second part, which would be the limit as t approaches 1, but this time from the right side, because now our interval is from 1 to 2, so we're moving down from 2 all the way to 1, so coming from the right-hand side of the integral from t to 2 of the function 1 over x minus 1 squared dx. Now remember, we only need to show that one of these diverges in order to show that the whole thing diverges. If both of these are numbers, it'll mean that the integral actually converges. So let's take a look at this one first. In order to figure this one out, we're going to have to figure out what the antiderivative of 1 over x minus 1 squared is. So all the way down at the bottom here, I'm going to take the integral of 1 over x minus 1 squared dx, and I think I'll be able to use u sub for this one. If we say let u be equal to x minus 1, that means that du is equal to dx. So we can say that this thing is equal to the integral of 1 over u squared du, 
since the du is equal to dx, that's the integral of u to the power of negative 2 du, and that is u to the power of negative 1 over negative 1, or negative 1 over u, or negative 1 over, and we know that u is equal to x minus 1, so x minus 1. Great, now we have our antiderivative. So we'll say this first one, we're just dealing with the first one here, is equal to the limit as t approaches 1 from the left-hand side of, and then I'm going to write in my antiderivative, negative 1 over x minus 1, evaluated at 0 and t. And I might as well do the second one too, because this is a free response question, I want to keep my work very neat and continuous and show every step that I'm doing. So I'll have plus the limit as t approaches 1 from the right-hand side. And this time we have the same exact antiderivative because it was the same original function, but we're evaluating it at t and 2. Now let's plug in t and subtract plugging in 0 for this one, and plug in 2 and subtract plugging in t for this one. Now only one of these needs to be divergent to make the whole thing diverge. Let's think about what happens if we plug in 1 coming from the left-hand side into this function right here. We would have negative 1 over 1 minus 1. That's a problem right there. We can't divide by 0. So we can say that this entire integral, the value of 0 to infinity of f of x dx, that one diverges because the limit as t approaches 1 from the left-hand side of negative 1 over t minus 1 does not exist. We only need that small portion of justification in order to show that the entire thing diverges. Because if one of those parts diverges, the entire thing must diverge. Consider the function f of x equals 3 over 2x squared minus 7x plus 5. Using the identity that 3 over 2x squared minus 7x plus 5, so this thing, is equal to 2 over 2x minus 5 minus 1 over x minus 1, find the value of the integral from 5 to infinity of f of x dx or show that it diverges. So this one is interesting because they kind of gave us something that tips me off to what integration technique we're going to have to use here. And they did part of the problem for us, which makes it nice. In this case, it looks like we're going to be using partial fraction decomp here. And I do have a separate video on that topic if you're not sure what that is. So if we have the function f of x, we're going to plug that in here. So I'm going to rewrite this as the integral from 5 to infinity of this. And then what's my problem here? Well, the infinity is the problem. So I'm going to rewrite this with a limit as t approaches infinity of the integral from 5 to t. And then I can break this one apart, this integral, into the integral of 2 over 2x minus 5 minus the integral of 1 over x minus 1. And in this case, it's actually not necessary to break it into two separate integrals. I misspoke earlier. All that we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this as this. Because then we can find the antiderivative of this pretty easily. Now for this first part, we're going to use u sub, and I'll show you why. If we have the integral of 2 over 2x minus 5, we, dx, we would need to say that u is equal to 2x minus 5, and we're going to get something other than du equals dx. We're going to get du dx is equal to 2, which means that 1 half du is equal to dx. Therefore, we're going to rewrite this as 1 half times the integral of 2 over u du. Now the 2 down here and the 2 up here will cancel, so we really just have the integral of u to the power of negative 1 du. Now instead of writing it as u to the power of negative 1, we're actually going to keep it as 1 over u, because when we have it as 1 over u, we can use that rule for the natural log. This is equal to the natural log of the absolute value of u, or the natural log of the absolute value of 2x minus 5. So that's what this part will be. And now that we are actually finding the antiderivative, we can take this integral off. So for that first part, we would have natural log of the absolute value of 2x minus 5. And then we have minus the natural log of the absolute value of x minus 1. That one we do not need to do off to the side with u sub because we see that it just has a coefficient of 1 down here. And then we're going from 5 up until t. Now when we are subtracting two natural logs, one property that we can use is synthesize those two into a division statement. So this is equal to the limit as t approaches infinity of the natural log of 2x minus 5 over x minus 1. And we're, still and we're still evaluating that at 5 and t. Then we can start plugging in things for t and subtract plugging things in for 5. Now 2 times 5 would make 10, minus 5 is 5, and then over 5 minus 1, so over 4, 
So this one is equal to the natural log of 2t minus 5 over t minus 1 minus the natural log of 5 fourths. So now what happens if we plug in infinity for t up here? Well, when we have an expression like 2t minus 5 over t minus 1, we have 2 times infinity up here and then just a regular infinity up here. So this thing is actually going to synthesize down into a 2. So when we plug in infinity, this just becomes a 2. We have natural log of 2 minus natural log of 5 fourths. So this entire thing is equal to the natural log of 2 minus the natural log of 5 fourths. And there was nowhere to plug in our infinity for t in this portion. However, we can then divide again because we, ha we have that property that says when we subtract two natural logs, we can divide their arguments. So I'm going to come down here and work this one out. We have natural log of, and I'll write that as 8 fourths, minus the natural log of 5 fourths is equal to the natural log of 8 fourths divided by 5 fourths. And 8 fourths divided by 5 fourths is really 8 fifths. So this is really just the natural log of 8 fifths. And that will be our final answer. This integral is equal to the natural log of 8 fifths.